And we did the work, and then at the end, I asked, I asked the client, I go, why did you pick, why did you pick us? You know, I was the youngest. You know, there was other firms. People were lowballing it too. He goes, you were the, uh, you were on time. You were the quickest. You were the most professional, and in the end, you over delivered. And it hit me. I thought, if you're starving for work, how, how, how did we beat people out on the fundamentals? Episode eighty-seven. This is. The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about running a more flexible, profitable, enjoyable architecture practice. And today I have an awesome show lined up. I'm joined today by Alex Gore. He's a principal and co-founder with Lance Psycho. That is truly his last name. We'll talk more about that. Of F9 Productions, a residential design and BIM creation firm in, based out of Longmont, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Alex is the co-creator of RevitFurniture.com, which provides Revit families, template files, and tutorials for architecture. He teaches at the University of Colorado at Boulder in the Environmental Design and Architectural Engineering Departments. He's also the upcoming author of The Architecture of Thinking Different, Getting More Out of Design and Life. But before we jump into the, the interview, first of all, uh, welcome, Alex. Welcome, Ian. How's it going? Man, it's going good. Well, before we jump into the interview, I just want to remind everyone and I want to thank BQE Software for their financial support of the Business of Architecture show, which allows me to continue to bring you these shows. Now, as you may have heard earlier, this month only you can win an iPad 3 by registering for a live walkthrough of ArchiOffice. Now, I'm going to be frank with you here. Most of you love to listen to the podcast, but not a whole lot of you love to jump on your computer and go to the links that I talk about. Okay, <laughs> So I know who you are. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that if you want to pick up this iPad Mini 3, you have a good chance of getting it. That's a little inside dirt there. But uh, in addition to that, you have the opportunity to see how ArchiOffice works. It's a cool program for managing your finances and managing a project. So go check it out. You can pick up that demo at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Now, if you want to really be famous and get a shout out on the show, go leave an iTunes review for Business of Architecture. Listen, I really appreciate it. I love seeing those reviews, you know, whether they're good or bad. Uh, you have to give a five-star review, of course. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. Yep, yep. Now, on with today's show. Alex, welcome. I gave your intro a little early today, but you are the principal and co-founder with Lance Psycho of F9 Productions. So welcome to the show, man. You know what? It, it, it's great to be on here. I've been uh, listening to you for a while. And actually, I want to jump in a quick story before we even get going. So uh, I love I stories. Like, yeah. Thanksgiving, uh, my fiance lives in Porterville, California. And for some reason, I think the weekend before, I, I, I contacted you. We were talking about chicken coop. And then somehow I found out that you were the next town up, which was just the happiest coincidence. So you or me said, hey, want to, want to meet for, you know, breakfast? And we did. And the thing that's about, you know, if people are watching this, they've seen you for a while. What they don't realize is you're like 6'3 tall. You are super tall. When I came into the restaurant, you're sitting down. I was like, oh, there's Enoch. You know, a little bit nervous, stuff like that. But he stood up. I was like, this guy's a giant. And uh, uh, you actually look younger in person, too. Not that you look old at all, but... Uh, I just thought I thought your fans should know that if they ever see you in you know at conventions or whatever, he's the tall guy, and you'll see him. Are you how tall are you? Nice. You know, I like to say six two and a half, so just a little bit shorter than six three. But you know, there you go. I'll say six three. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Well, and on that note, uh, Alex, I want to let our listeners know how you contacted me because I've seen other people do this. And it's a really cool way to meet someone that you've wanted to meet or maybe build a relationship. So, um, you know, Alex just sent me a little video clip. He was out working on a chicken coop. Uh, that's a whole nother story. But he's yeah. like, hey, Nick, man, I was listening to your podcast. I was thinking about you. I recorded this little video clip. And that was the email. So then I clicked on that link. And, of course, there was Alex kind of telling me what he was up to, telling me, you know, his thoughts about the show, et cetera. You know, so it was pretty cool. And uh, I've seen other people do that. It's a good way to get noticed by someone who, you know, you don't have an introduction to before. Yeah, and no one is also great about that. So, you know, a lot of us work a lot. Um, and on the weekend, I try to stay away from my computer because, one, my fiancé will probably yell at me, and, two, I'm sick of looking at a screen. So I was like, why don't I just record a video? And then I don't have to do anything, and I don't have to type, check my spelling, anything like that. 
So I actually want to use that. You're the only guy I ever use it on, but I, I think it's, it's almost a quicker. It's like a long Snapchat. That's basically what it was. Absolutely, and you look different. I mean, well, I mean, you're different than the other people who are trying to get a hold of influencers, right? So if there's a new, you know, even a client or someone, and that's just an incredible way just to keep touch and be a little bit different because everyone sends emails. I mean, we're so almost oblivious to emails now. Yeah, and know what? That's a great point because we did use that on one of our clients. We were making a little book for them, and they actually pulled it out weird. So instead of, like, you know, giving it to them in Photoshop and saying, like, it's going to pull it out, we printed a copy. And I think Fernando, which was one of our interns, filmed me, and I kind of just, you know, like laid it out piece by piece and sent it off again in another easy way. So uh, take advantage of that. That's a great point if you can. Brilliant, man, brilliant. Well, uh, a little bit earlier before this call, you were downstairs because you felt it had a better background for the video. Yeah. Admittedly, it probably did. But then you were on Wi-Fi, so the connection wasn't that good. So you jump back upstairs. You're now in your office space. Uh, show us around the little space there. Let our viewers see what you guys yeah. are up to there. So I'm a little bit embarrassed by the top. This is the third place we've been. We started in my dining room. We were there for a couple of years. And I we actually had that kind of decked out and it looked nice. Then I moved. We are in a bedroom. And now we're actually in, um, you know, if you're in the downtown, some old buildings, old uh, houses have lawyers and stuff. And that's where we're at. So basically, this is this is where we're at. We have we have five guys in our firm. Only Jackson's here right now. Jackson, say hi. Hey, Jackson. Jackson's working. Basically, we gave... Uh, the newer you are, the better supercomputer you get. So <laughs> Jack has the best computer. Um, this is Daryl right behind me. He might be, he'll probably interrupt and walk in while we're in the middle of something. Um, Lance is over on the other computer over there, and Fernando, our intern, he only comes in two days, and he has he was our first employee. He either sits right by me, super close, or over by Lance. So um, we also have. A little closet where we have all the stuff that we're supposed to pin up, but we're moving in a couple months, so we're not going to do it anyways. Um, so it's just a, a, a little bedroom, a little too tight for us right now, but, you know, that's how it goes. Yeah, awesome. So for those of you who are listening and can't experience the visceral quality of the video, you know, I'll summarize. So it's, it's a small room, I'd say, which you have 200, 300 square feet there, more? 12 by 8. Yeah, 12 by 8. So they got five guys in there. They're crowded in there, but I just wanted you guys to see that to know, listen, man, this is how you start out. You know, you get, you're scrappy, you're starting up. And I know I've had quite a few uh, startup interviews on here. This one's going to be a little bit different, so I'm pretty excited to get into it with Alex. So, Alex, let's let's take it back a little bit. Let's introduce people to, like, who you are, uh, your background, and let's talk about your startup story because you are a young firm, and you also have taken a kind of a different approach with building the firm. So let's let's take it back a couple years and just let people know who you are. Okay, so I um, went to school, got a master's in, in architecture at NDSU. Great school, really loved it. Um, and what was interesting then is because this was before the crash. So the year above me, they were doing their thesis presentations and getting phone calls. And they'd have to, like I remember the guy saying, I need to take this. It's a job offer. During and, like, a thesis presentation. Yeah, how perfect timing. And I was like, I can't, I can't wait till next year until I'm done with my thesis, just getting job interviews. And all of a sudden, it was, I think it was just 2008 then, and I was asking my professor, like, why isn't anyone home? And he's like, don't worry about it. You know, everything's fine. And obviously, it wasn't fine. Um, so it was harder to get jobs, but I did land a job at uh, Studio Daniel Leapskin, which was very fortunate, out of New York. And then my business partner was out here with Studio HT, and both of them won Young Architect of the Year, independently of, of the whole United States. So it was a great firm to work with. But then 2009 happened, and as a lot of you guys know, that didn't work out for a lot of people. Our firm laid off, I think we had 60 people in New York, and they laid off 11, um, and I was the last one. And Nina barely hired me, and I had to sweet talk her just to get hired, which was great. Um, she's a wonderful gal. But we, we were kind of in the rut then. You know, didn't know what to do. No one was hiring, anything like that. So we kind of had this, there was no other choice. Uh, Lance had a couple kids. Um, he had a wife to support. I was by myself. I had a couple, you know, some some dough, but, you know, n nothing really to go on. And we kind of just jumped into it from there. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know how deep you want me to go or individual stories about how well, we That's started. fine. So, so obviously, so Studio Daniel Leviskin, where you were at, I mean, the firm held on to as long as they possibly could, yeah. like they probably did with everyone. Eventually, they had to let you go. Same yep. thing with Studio HT. Did they have to downsize and let let Lance go also? They did. They did. Okay. It was just 
um, I'm sure multiple people, even even you and your backstory, have experienced just the tightening of, of the recession. Yep. And, you know, it, it, we all know it hit young and old and experienced and inexperienced across the board. So yeah. so here you guys are. You're sitting, you're thinking, okay, we got to make ends meet. So you start doing some freelance work, right? Yeah. Well, the first, I got I got laid off first. And I said, Lance, I go, you you might get laid off. Um, I was talking to him in New York. And I remember um, I remember that, like, that night because I got laid off. And then my girlfriend at the time was like, oh, maybe we should break up. And I was like, why would you say that right now? <laughs> <laughs> Back away from the ledge, Alex. Yeah, Back yeah. away from the window. Yeah, but 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 we did it, and, and it was a good relationship and all that. But I called Lance up and I said, "Hey, if you you know we can see the writing on the wall, let's start some." We were listening to I was listening to Pat. Um, let's start some passive income stuff like that. And I, we didn't know what to do, but he said I can start making bin models. So we made all this furniture. I go, I can start the website. Because when we graduated, we had this party on the top of the Hodo, which is this nice uh, uh, hotel in Fargo. And we were like, maybe in 10 to 15 years, you know, we'll start a firm together. Because Lance and I were uh, partners in um, in college. We did a skyscraper competition and stuff like that. Oh, here's so he won thesis award. So he thinks he's better than me. But I but I won the uh, what what is it called the Alpha Rho Chi Medal, which is given out every architecture uh, school gives out one to the best student. So we have fights at, at who's better. Um, <laughs> I, I'm on the show right now, so obviously it's me. <laughs> oh snap! <laughs> yeah. So so anyways, he started making bin models and got the attention of Turbo Squid, is where he, he published it. And then Turbo Squid had some people coming in, and we actually so a, a large portion of our work is, is making models for ArtCat and different companies like that. So everything from, you know, lumber liquidators that you can go get to, to windows to uh, Pergo, I think they're railings. Anyways, we've done probably 300 different manufacturers. And that really helped us get a kind of base. But then we needed to start getting clients too. We, we couldn't rely on that. And the interesting part, I think that we did, because we were so young, we were able to to start fresh, and we were able to look at everything from a fresh perspective. So, like our contracts, how would if, if you know Enoch, if, if you were my client and you're just coming to build your first home, if it's, if it's your first home, you don't know the process. You you might have an inkling. So, our contracts lay out in you know like what you can expect in the first two weeks. You know, breaks down and explains like SD, you know, schematic design, design document phase, and then construction document phase, and then gives a deliverable. So, like, it, it's this very clear and logical step. Um, and then, you know, we execute off of that, too. And even in our um, proposals, so um, when we do our proposals, we have an Excel spreadsheet, and it basically has those listed in. You just estimate the hours and then put them in and then translate that right to, uh, you know, our bid, you know, our contract to them, and then just execute right off of that. Um, and then, so another story, when, when we got here, Basically, he had the BIM work, um, and he was he was nervous about bringing me down because he didn't want to lay anyone off. You know, he didn't want to say, "Hey, come down here," and then all of a sudden we have nothing. I I had I was living in with my parents. I was like, "I'm getting out here no matter what. If if, if this tanks, it tanks. No big deal." Um, but anyways, I started to get work, and the first one I got was a pot shop. It was the grow room for a pot shop. And if you aren't in California or Colorado or Washington, I, I was from Minnesota, so that was unique to me. And we did the work, and then at the end, I asked, I asked the client, I go, why did you pick, why did you pick us? You know, I was the youngest. You know, there was other firms. People were lowballing it too. He goes, you were the, uh, you were on time. You were the quickest. You were the most professional, and in the end, you overdelivered. And it hit me. I thought, if you're starving for work, how, how, how did we beat people out on the fundamentals? And I think that's huge. I think people forget the fundamentals. You get too maybe high and mighty, or, or you just forget that those basics, I think, are what really matter, and that's what we try to stick to. Everything from that to how we even make our models, our BIM models, our Revit models, all that stuff, is all based off of just really nailing the fundamentals and growing off of that. Mm. How did you I, get the lead for that, that, that pot that, shot you did? It was Craigslist. And actually, we don't use Craigslist as much right now. We use Thumbtack. We used to have Google AdWords. Um, we've got some strategies to get into magazines. But uh, the client I was telling you about earlier, Enoch, that we're going to do a really cool 
concrete house. We also we're doing 24 units for him that are, you know, in the city right now. We're going to do 24 more. I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and he, and I go, how did you how did you contact us? And he said Craigslist too. So it's amazing how much I think Craigslist can be a hit or a miss. Mm. But this one client within this last year and this next year, we'll probably do a hundred thousand dollars worth of work through a guy we met off of Craigslist. So don't don't be afraid of of that at all. I would say. Hey, Architect Nation! It is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. Archie Office has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archieoffice.com. Now back to our show. Tell me the story about the developer you're talking about. We talked about right before our call. Mm. Something you're working on right now. Yeah, so we're doing a bunch of units um, for him down in the Denver area. And a couple weeks ago, I said, uh, "Hey, I want to let's do a concrete house sometime." You know, and I was just throwing that out there because you know, concrete and glass house, you know, they're more expensive. Uh, it's hard to get. It's hard to get. You know, the design that you know architects are kind of really striving for. And I just threw it out there, and he goes, "He goes, keep those ideas because I'm your developer." And all of a sudden, um, the last project that we went in permitting was just a little house, and we nailed the floor plan. The floor plan is. It is close to a, like a flawless floor plan that I've done, and he loves it too. And he said, I got a lot closer to Denver. He goes, if we can fit that floor plan on there, I can sell that, no matter if we do it in concrete glass or, or whatever. Um, so go for it. So uh, and I showed him some pictures of Jonathan Segal, who's amazing at architecture, at business, all that other stuff, and he liked that stuff. So hopefully, um, hopefully we can kind of mimic that style with our own floor plan. And really crush it. And that's another thing. So uh, tangent, we, we teach at CU, and one of the things we try to you know get into their head is don't be afraid to look at different examples because one, it's a different situation. Two, it's probably a different layout. But three, more importantly, you're a different person. Like Enoch, you'll always design differently from me. I'll always design different just because of our backgrounds and all that stuff. But if you're ever stuck, don't be afraid to take those examples and you know really apply it to what what you're doing. Um, one example of that is uh, the, the picture that I think will be on this is, is a house down in Golden. And I was down there a couple weeks ago, and the guy walked out. He's like, oh, are you doing the house across the street, too? I go, no, we you know, just came and looked. He's like, it looks like an exact copy of yours. And it is a copy of ours. It's, it's, actually, it's actually not a good copy. They, they did some things wrong. But some people are like, aren't you upset? I'm like, no, I'm not upset. You know, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a good house. Um, I don't, other people might have different opinions on that, stuff like, um, but I was a little bit flattered that, that, that he copied us. I wish, when I copy someone, I try to one-up them, and this guy went the other way, but that's just my opinion. Nice, nice. Now, that is an interesting story. So, the, the house you're referring to, Alex, I will put it on the show, so it's going to be on the webpage where this show is hosted, and it is... It it has the massing of what I would say would be a typical sort of Denver suburban home in terms of two story. Um, the massing is definitely kind of like that. There might be some some interesting cutouts. But you had a, a an existing foundation that you were working with when you started this house. Yeah. And um, I think it's in a subdivision of some other kind of traditional looking homes, right? Exactly. So again, this was this was actually the first house that Lance and I actually ever landed. Um. And and he didn't want to go with us because because we were so young. Actually, he kept asking all these questions, you know, like what about this? What about this? Um, and then Lance was, you know, back and forth on the phone. We were pacing around it in our room because we really wanted to land this. And then I I, I like shout, but in a whisper, like shouted at Lance, tell him about all your construction experience because Lance has a lot of construction experience. So he told him how he built all these houses from when he was fifteen, and then the guy said, "Bam, we're ready to go." So the lot was because of the recession, they built the foundation, the whole basement, and then just left it, left the property. So we were left with a property that was meant to be these houses that were right next to which were um, just, you know, regular regular houses, um, regular architecture. Um, they had, everything was cut up, so like the stairs were in the middle, the kitchen was on one side, the living room was on the other side, just peak roofs, you know, not too terrible, but nothing special. And we, we, we tried to do something cool with it. So we opened up that whole 
living, you know, it's living room, dining room, um, kitchen. Uh, the first floor plan works out great. We, we did some slanted shed roofs to match the kind of peaks that are in Denver. So that really, you can't probably see it in the picture because the house is blocking it, but everyone kind of knows what mountains and, and, and Denver looks like. So it kind of matches with that. And the reason the guy copied us was because they sold so fast. So in the, they, they sold just like that. Uh, and I think it was because the design was a little bit better. It's, it's not, you know, high architecture, but it, it, it was good architecture. Cool, cool, definitely, man. I like that. I, I like how you took what you had to work with and then you ran with it and created something cool. But the special, I didn't know that part about someone actually uh, using it for inspiration. And <laughs> yes, we'll that. say that. That's cool. inspiration. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so how did you t how did you uh, get your early work last? Um, I'm sorry, Alex. How, tell us about how you guys built the firm. Yeah, so it goes back to um, starting in the summer of I think 2009. I was about five years old. So um, we had we had that BIM work, um, and then we, we started on Craigslist and Google Ads, and um, just just kind of getting getting whatever whatever we can. And the the story behind that was the year before I was at at NDSU and Julie Snow. I don't know if you guys know Julie Snow, but she's a good architect. she's a great architect up in Minnesota. I think she's a famous architect, but but maybe not to, to other people. And she was off speaking, and I asked her. I go, she started out. Um, you know, from a different firm, I go, how did you get clients? And she basically told me the story where she had a client, they liked her at the firm, and then she kind of just took it. And I was like, that is not helpful whatsoever when you have zero clients. So it was literally the Craigslist. It was Craigslist and, and Google Ads and then talking to people. But I think what really made us, you know, get the clients was we made – uh, we made a conscious decision that, like, we if we met with a client and they asked for a contract, within 24 hours we would return. Uh, just simple, simple rules like that, always being in, in contact, I think make a big difference because sometimes it's not about the price. Now going to the, the price a, a little bit more. Sometimes it's just about time, that commodity that we have that we can't get back. I just lost a project where they wanted me to finish five houses in, in three, four weeks. And I said, professionally, I can't promise that. You know, I can't, I can't put my, out. you know, I don't want to lie or anything like that. And they went with someone else. And that's, that's fine um, because I wasn't, I wasn't about to, you know, lie about what I could or could not do. But just being there when people want to do something and want to make a house or something like that and everyone else is taking forever or taking their time and they're like, we're ready to go. This one just seems perfectly logical. Why don't we go with that? We've gotten so many clients just because of that, um, which really helped us. And when we yeah. talked, you mentioned that a large part of your earlier work you actually did for other architects. Is that right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So some of it, um, I don't know how we got in contact with Oz Architects. Um, they're a big firm here in Denver. So we did, during the recession, they don't they didn't want to hire. They probably cut back on their, their staff. I can't speak to any numbers, but we did all their renderings for a couple of years. Um, then we worked with this guy, Jerry Boland, who's an architect. And um, we're actually unlicensed, um, which is it's probably good for, for some of your listeners to hear um, because depending on your state, um, you don't have to be a licensed architect to design a house. And in some jurisdictions, um, and a lot in Denver, what you just basically need is you need a structural engineer to stamp your foundations. We normally have them stamp our foundations and our framing plans. And we do the framing plans too just so we can get um, you know a little bit more money and we're quicker and we're cheaper than an engineer. Um, and then we can kind of, you know, work that process in. But uh, I don't know where I was going with this. Where was I going, Enoch? You were talking about doing work for other architects, and oh, you mentioned Jerry yeah. Bolin and and Oz Architects. And then um, because basically because um, when the recession hit, we realized that there wasn't going to be a lot of big commissions, you know, like twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollar house commissions just to do one house. So our approach was we're going to get all the low hanging. So we're going to get five additions rather than one big house, four additions, right? So we had to make a system behind that to be able to, to execute on that. So we really started working on our Webit model so that all of our sheets were set up, all of our schedules were set up. Uh, all the furniture that Lance made for BIM was put in there, and we made it so that it was render ready. So if they ever wanted that, if we ever got that, um, we could execute and then get a higher profit on it because everything's already set up. So, um, so we were able to execute um, and basically position ourselves. And here's another little little 
little secret that we did. Again, since we are we are fresh, we came we came down here and we put out a Craigslist ad and we said, hey, we're looking for um, a house, two bedroom, three bedroom, whatever, two baths. We laid it all twelve hundred square foot. Um, what do you guys do it for? And and could we, you know you know basically pretending we were a client. And the reason we did that was because it was it was such a hard time back then. You know, what do you do when you have kids, when you have people relying on you, when you have no money? So we took all that information, and then we started to build our contracts off of that, and we started to think logically, like, oh, my God, these, you know, they're all over the place. Let's make this as logical and as simple as possible. And then we positioned ourselves. We wanted to position ourselves in the middle. So we had, you know, we had all our numbers, and we said um, we wanted to say the low guy, you can't make money being the low guy. You can do it once or twice if you're starving. And it's actually a strategy. Some of the bigger projects that we know will help lift our firm, like with Steve, our first bid was was a low bid just to get it because we know it will be a strategic step. If it's not a strategic step, we won't make that low bid. We'll be the middle guy. Um, because And we've worked with low guys for engineers and stuff like that. And unless they're just starving and they really want to do it, they're going to be late. They're not going to be communicative, all that stuff. There will always be the exception to that, but that's that's – you know, our feeling. And we knew we couldn't, we couldn't be the high guy. We want to move into the high guy. But it, it, if you are the high guy, normally you have a little bit more credentials. You maybe have a system in place, um, all that stuff. We just didn't think, especially in the recession, that uh, we could get that bit. So that's how we got, you know, that's how we really maintained ourselves was that middle role and then getting, know that we needed multiple, multiple projects and then setting up a, a template, a Revit, you know, system so that we could execute that and not, you know, not kind of um, produce a bad result. Yep. Yeah. So you guys have streamlined some document production. Now, I want to, you know, you mentioned that you guys are unlicensed right now. Yeah. What's the plan for the future? I mean, I know there's a lot of young designers who are in the situation where they were not employed. They started doing their own thing, started right. building a business. They don't have a license. So um, wh what do you guys think about that? What's What's your plan? Yeah, so um, we have a plan, and ever since that first pot shop, we got with an architect in town, Jerry Bolden, um, and he's basically been our mentor. So find a mentor somewhere in the community. And, and our arrangement was, you know, we happened to, we had a good marketing plan, so we can help keep him busy by being the oversight, all that, you know, all that, and then he'll help, you know, give us those nuggets of wisdom and, and be our mentor. Um, so... Lance is currently, he just took his first test. He's taking his second test. He's he basically, I think he's done with ours. So probably this summer we'd be licensed. And I, I bet we'd probably only be licensed two years ago if we were in a regular firm. It just happened that, you know, all this happened. So if you're by yourself, don't don't be afraid to maybe go off on your own. Find, find a mentor. Find an engineer, too. And, and you can do it. You can even technically do in Colorado, I think. 13,000 square foot commercial under one story. Not not that we do it because you need to kind of know your limitations too. We always bring Jerry involved because he'll see stuff that you will you know that you won't see, you won't catch. Um, so it's always good to have those relationships. I think, yeah. and, and that's been our plan. Now, are you are you worried at all about the the limited experience you have in some of the larger projects holding you back in the future? Yes, and no. Um, I would say, yes, it might, you know, we probably won't get, you know, a museum anytime soon, which is, you know, probably everyone's dream, but I want to, maybe I'm just telling this to myself, I feel like we're doing it in the right way. So, um, at least for us. So we started with additions and houses and now with, uh, now we're doing that 24 unit complex. It's soon going to turn into 48. We've done some, uh, little, little clinics. We've, uh, done a, a gas station up, up in North Dakota now. So by the time we get to those bigger things, maybe a school or something like that, I feel like we'll run the gamut and we'll start to see all those little issues on a, on a less stressful case. Like I was just out on a job site and they put the anchor bolts in the middle. We had a, we had a 10 foot wide so that we could have a brick line. And instead of putting them where the wall should be, they put them right in the middle. So we had a couple of different options and, uh, the insider knowledge that you might not know, but wasn't actually the solution is, oh, you can cut those off. You can drill down and put expansion bolts if you really want. So that's something like if you don't know, an architect might tell you or I might just tell you right now. 
But the other one was the contractor said, well, let's just move the wall three inches. Because it's a garage and we're not into the setback and we're all good. And I'll order three inch longer lumber on top. Like, perfect. No big deal. Um, but anyways, what that leads to is, you know, let's say we're at a bigger, you know, job site and where those inches really will matter and, you know, we're out looking at the foundation. You know, make sure the anchor bolts are where the wall is going to line up. And a lot of that, a lot of that the contractor will catch. A lot of that the sub will catch. So, um, that's how we're trying to build up, you know, in, into those larger projects. But if we could just get great commissions on houses, that's probably all we'd ever do. But we'll see how that works out. So with so, your drawings and with your arrangement uh, with uh, Jerry, how does it how does it not become plan stamping then under the laws of uh, Colorado? Um, because I think because he's integral into our process. So uh, we meet with Jerry all the time, um, and, and it works out. And a lot of it is actually a lot of our stuff, um, I don't even think legally it's needed because we have an engineer stamp on it. So it, it's it's kind of that just um, taking the extra precautions and, and, and working with an architect just, just so we can get the knowledge. Technically, it's not needed. Awesome. Yeah. Alex, when we were talking, when we met here in California, you were talking about how you guys, one of your strengths is being able to deliver projects quickly, to do construction documents like no one else and yeah. to make sure you have a really tight set, but you're using some pretty cool technology tools to do that. So I just want to let's pick that up in uh, in the next episode. Let's jump into a little bit about your technical workflow, give our listeners some tips and pointers about how they can be more efficient with their construction documents and what you guys are doing. Sounds great. Sounds good, man. All right. Hey, by the way, do you, would you be willing to put your contract? You mentioned you have your own contract. Could we share that with the listeners? Absolutely. Just, uh, you know, a version of that. We'll put that in the show notes, and then you know we'll also put a note to Jonathan Siegel, who was mentioned during this episode, uh, down in the show notes. So, Alex, thanks for joining me today. No problem. It's been great. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.